When the Law Society of Upper Canada decided to sponsor a one-day workshop on basic problems in evidence, the response was somewhat larger than was anticipated, and the program was therefore subsequently repeated. The workshops took the form of a lecture followed by a panel discussion in each of the morning and afternoon sessions. The panel discussions were, however, a little out of the ordinary. They consisted of a number of short TV scenarios, each of them followed by a panel discussion examining the various evidentiary problems that arose. In the second workshop, the panels were switched around a little so as to give some variety in opposing views. Both sessions were recorded on videotape, and these programs are an edited version of the discussions of the evidentiary problems arising from the simulated courtroom scenarios. I do not think you will find many clear-cut answers to these fairly common problems. What you will find are discussions of some basic but extremely important principles from which solutions are suggested. This program is designed primarily for the legal profession, though we hope that others will be interested and will perhaps gain some insight into the workings of this aspect of the legal system and the way in which the law tries to reconcile conflicting interests. For the lawyers in particular, citations and references will be given for cases and materials mentioned should they wish to make a note of them. There were, in total, four panels, of which two each discussed separately half of the fact situations. On the first day, chairing panel number one was the Honourable Mr. Justice Edson Haynes of the Supreme Court of Ontario. With him appeared Mr. William Poole, QC, practicing in London, Ontario, and a member of the Ontario Law Reform Commission, and Professor Hugh Silverman, QC, a practitioner of many years standing, and now a professor of law at the University of Windsor. Chairing panel number two was the Honorable Mr. Justice Thomas Zuber of the Supreme Court of Ontario, and with him were Mr. Clay Powell, QC, counsel in the Ministry of the Attorney General of Ontario, and Professor Desmond Morton, QC, who is both a practitioner and a law professor at the University of Toronto. Mr. Justice Zuber also chaired the first panel on the second day's program, and appearing with him on that occasion were Mr. Justice Frank Weatherston of the Supreme Court of Ontario, and again, Professor Hugh Silverman. Mr. Justice Haynes chaired the last panel, again with Mr. Clay Powell and Professor Morton as the panelists. As a result of the editing, panel discussions do not always appear in the order in which they were presented. In carrying on our everyday activities, most of us consciously or unconsciously use statistics of one sort or another relating to incomes or prices or cost of living or life expectancy. In this fourth situation, the question is discussed how far can the courts use those statistics? What is the testimonial relevance of perhaps official or semi-official or even private tables and statistics? Must the court require, first of all, some guarantee of reliability? Must an expert give his professional opinion based on those statistics? Or can the court merely look at the relevant tables and come to their own conclusions? Plaintiff is claiming damages for a loss of an arm. Prior to his accident, he was a crane operator and is no longer able to perform this job. Plaintiff's counsel calls an actuary to establish the plaintiff's working life expectancy. What was Mr. Smith's working life expectancy on May the 23rd, 1972? 21.3 years. And how is that figure arrived at? It's based on life expectancy tables prepared in connection with the 1961 Census of Canada. Well, Lord, that evidence is clearly hearsay. Right. What would you think about it, Mr. Poole? I would say that the actuary is allowed to give his opinion the same as any other expert 
witness. And I would ask him when he was giving the evidence, what are some of the tools of your trade? And he would say actuarial tables. And I would ask him, is this usual in the field in which you operate? Is this how actuaries get their information? Uh, he would reply, yes. Uh, and I would ask him, do you use other tables in addition to this? But I would establish from at the end that having used all this information and quoting this information, that it was his opinion that he was giving, not the actuarial table. And I think it would go as to wait. Now, who can contradict him? Only another actuary. What tables is he using? The very same ones. So you wouldn't dare to contradict him. So the lawyer in this case, who said it's hearsay, is putting himself in an impossible position. To sum up, the <laughs> I would admit the evidence on the basis of opinion evidence that it's tools of the trade that he can use and his whole, whole evidence of the actuary would go to wait, but it's admissible. May I put your thought somewhat differently and ask you whether you agree with it? This is an expert witness, whether it's a doctor, scientist, an engineer of any type, and the expert is there to assist the court in drawing appropriate inferences, and if you can give the jury or the judge any help, we want it. Now, do we not expect of our experts to be up to date, to read all, and read widely, all materials that have to do with the field. In fact, if they don't, we cross-examine them into the ground because of their failure to do so. And wherever any of the documents that they study and use, as you say, the tools of their trade, that they can say possess practical trustworthiness because they are accepted by persons interested in their trustworthiness, and I base my opinion on these and the other facts, doesn't that then make the evidence admissible? What do you think? Well, I think that's just what I said. <laughs> <laughs> now, having led you into that, let's take, for example, the life expectancy table here. Now, is there not an error as far as our question is concerned? Because his life expectancy may be, according to the tables, 21.3 years, but I'm reasonably certain those tables have nothing to say about working expectancy. I think you've got to cut that off and say, assume he's going to work till 65, because that's when everybody retires in his job. I think that's got to be clarified, hasn't it? Well, I, to, to be perfectly frank, Mr. Chairman, I... Uh, Assumed it was in the uh, life expectancy No, table. I didn't even notice the distinction until you pointed it out. Uh, All right. Well, let's go a bit further. Is there a difference between life expectancy tables and actuarial tables? Because today we're having more and more actuarial evidence come forward. And if I may observe <coughs> on just for a moment... The way an actuary works is not only on the life expectancy tables. The actuary is asked, what would it cost to produce a yearly annuity for this man, for his life expectancy? And the way the actuary does it is this. He takes a thousand men of that particular age group in Canada. He assumes that they have a life expectancy on the average in other words, at the end of a certain period of time, they're all going to be dead. He knows that some of that thousand are going to die tomorrow, and others are going to live on beyond that period. And he comes up with a figure which invested at a certain percent, compounded and so on, that when the last man dies, the last dollar is spent. And then he says it costs so much to produce that annuity. And I think that one of the greatest errors we make is not distinguishing between life expectancy and annuity value. And I think we're going to get more and more and more of this before the courts and I recommend that you do consult with actuaries. And secondly, may I make this suggestion to you, that your actuaries can and do take into consideration the devaluation of the dollar and the rising cost of living. They've got excellent tables on this. And there's no uniformity of decision amongst our courts as to whether we can take that into consideration. The law is in a state of flux in that regard. But when you're coming forward, particularly with a jury, and you're asking to compensate a man for the loss of an arm, which will be for the rest of his life, 
you've got to make that jury think in terms of, well, what's the compensation we're going to give him 15 years from now, 25 years from now? And therefore, the depreciating value of the dollar can be achieved quite readily, and I've heard actuaries give this evidence, it would cost X dollars to produce $1,000 a year for the coming year, 1,030 for the next 1,060 and so on, so that the jury are able to appreciate this problem. They don't, they don't have to accept it, and the judge so tells them. But to me, it brings into the compensation of damages an appreciation of the dollar and what can be done with it. So that, as you said, and I think it's important, if the private sector of business recognizes these things, when they're setting up their annuity tables and all the rest of it, why shouldn't the courts? There would, there would appear to be at least two problems here, and uh, perhaps we can start with the most distant one first, dealing with the admissibility of the census report itself, just, just that much of it, uh, as, as perhaps a public record. Professor Martin, what, what would you think about, about whether or not the census report itself is just admissible uh, because it is a census report? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer in view of a, a decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal with respect to uh, statistical reports. Uh, cases, the Northern Electric case, and uh, in that case, an attempt was made to put in the certain uh, uh, compilations of uh, trade statistics made by the then Dominion Bureau of Statistics, now, of course, Statistics Canada, and the court said that they could not be received and acted upon because, of course, they, there was no way of verifying them. They're purely anonymous. Uh, uh, it had to do with the, the, the number of people who were involved in the production of copper wiring in Canada. And all the data had been fed in and then analyzed and then reported. And uh, it was held in, uh, traditionally, and in my view properly, that this was not proper evidence because it had the very evils of all hearsay evidence. That is, the person who made it, the person, the person who assembled this data was not there to be cross-examined. And secondly, even if you got the compiler of the statistics there, the, 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 the actual statistician and cross-examined them, you wouldn't be able to get through to the truth of the data at all. Now, admittedly, it cuts you off from a tremendous uh, 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 amount of information. So I suppose the returns of a census would be very much the same. They would be one of the functions of Statistics Canada now. Um, one of the reasons why I, I intend to support the common law rule is that I find statistics, uh, Canadian criminal statistics, are totally unreliable and largely meaningless. Uh, crime rates in Canada rise and fall as police chiefs f report or fail to report the crimes in their community. All right. Well, <laughs> let, let's, let's assume... Uh, Mr. Justice Weatherston, that Professor Morton is right, that the 1961 census figures do not qualify as a public record and an exception to the hearsay rule and are not admissible themselves. Despite that fact, can, the, can this actuary testify in the manner in which he seeks to do? It's quite unnecessary. The, the, the purpose of the actuary there is to say how much it's going to cost to, to uh, feed this man for a certain period of time. He is not asserting the truth of the actuarial tables. He's saying, uh, basing my expert opinion on the assumption that the tables are accurate, it's going to cost so much money. Uh, he, he cannot say uh, the life expectancy is so many years. But he says, uh, the tables say the life expectancy so much, and taking that as the truth, my opinion is thus and so. I think that's perfectly proper. Right. So, the, in, in effect, the expert is, in, as the cases have told us, the expert is entitled to rely on hearsay, things that wouldn't be admissible themselves in court, but he can utilize them in the formulation of his opinion. And if it, they're shown to be unreliable, then his opinion collapses with the material on which he relies. Right. <laughs> Professor Martin, anything? Well, no, I, I fully agree that in this circumstance, the the man is giving an expert, the actor is giving expert advice and is fully entitled to refer to any 
appropriate resources. Right. Dis and then just to make this clear, despite the fact that those things themselves would not be admissible. Quite. Well, right. I mean, my, that would be my position. Right.